while you're turning there, I want to thank the church again for giving me an opportunity to preach. I definitely consider it a great blessing, and I don't take it lightly. So I thank you guys all for giving me this opportunity. And on a side note, uh, if my wife happens to go into labor, <laughs> I might get a condensed version today. So if I start talking really fast, you'll uh, you know the reason why. <laughs> Galatians chapter 1, verses 3, uh, starting in verse 3. Follow along as I read. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from this present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for giving us an opportunity to study your word today. Lord, I just ask for your strength and your wisdom that you soften all our hearts and we don't merely just listen to the word today, but that we apply it to our lives. And Lord, please guide me that everything I say today will do nothing but bring glory to the amazing God that you are. I thank you, God, so much for saving me and for dying for my sins. I love you. I pray this in Jesus' name. I want to start off today by reading a quote uh, from preacher Charles Spurgeon. The hearing of the gospel involves the hearer in responsibility. It is a great privilege to hear the gospel. You may smile and think there is nothing very great in it. The damned in hell know. Oh, what would they give if they could hear the gospel now? If they could come back and entertain but the shadow of a hope that they might escape from the wrath to come. The saved in heaven estimate this privilege at a high rate for having obtained salvation through the preaching of this gospel. They can never cease to bless their God for calling them by his word of truth. Oh, that you knew it. On your dying beds, the listening to a gospel sermon will seem another thing than it seems now. I've heard a few preachers state that they don't believe we'll ever know everything there is about the gospel on this side of eternity. The depths and the truths of what all happened on the cross are most certainly enough for a lifetime worth of studies. And the Bible supports this uh, by giving us a vast amount of reasons for why we are to study and how it applies to our life. In the Old Testament, there's estimated over 400 prophecies that point to the gospel and the life of Christ. Studying 400 prophecies is something that one should certainly spend a great deal of time on. In the New Testament, we can see reasons why the gospel applies to our daily lives. Paul, in the book of Romans, in chapter 12, he tells us that by the mercies of God, we're to offer our entire lives as a sacrifice to God. God's mercies are most certainly seen in the gospel. And Jesus, in commanding us uh, to take part in communion, or to remember the body that was broken for us. We remember the blood that was shed for our forgiveness of sins. Yet with all of these points, Christians sometimes look at the cross or the gospel as something elementary, as something they've already accepted. It's, it's like spiritual milk. It's a truth they they received and became a part of the church, and now they moved on. They need something deeper, something more, uh, something more for them. I've even heard Christians say that, hearing a testimony, how, how is it relevant to my life to hear someone else's testimony? And the Bible most 
almost certainly tells us that we should be pursuing more spiritual food, that we need to wean off the spiritual milk. But with all the reasons that I've given, we need to be careful what we consider spiritual milk as the gospel but certainly doesn't fit in this category. It is the cornerstone of our faith. It's the rock on which we stand. So today, as we go through the message, it, it may be something you've heard. You may have heard some of the points a hundred times already. But I want you to search your hearts and, and ask yourself, what does the gospel mean to you? Ask, what does the Bible say it should mean to you? Is it just a message? Something to get you into the church and you've moved on? Do you think it's spiritual milk? Is it the foundation of your life? Think about the quote from Spurgeon. And how those in hell would have loved to hear it once more. And how those in heaven consider it a privilege at a high rate. Ask yourself these questions. Before we dive into the message, I want to give a little bit of background on the passage in the book of Galatians. Even looking at the context, I feel uh, there's more evidence to show as to why we should study the gospel. First of all, the letter is written by Paul. There's no debate on this as the book starts off with Paul identifying himself as the author. There is a little debate on exactly what churches the letter was written to. However, there's an agreement the letter was written to churches. And the text is found in the beginning of the letter. It's part of the greeting, or the introduction. And finally, one, main, one of the main purposes of this letter is Paul is addressing the fact that the churches have accepted a false gospel, a works-based gospel. So once again, looking at all this information, we see more reasons as to why we should continue to study the gospel. One could make the argument that since Paul is writing this letter to churches, it shows he believes that churches still need to be hearing the gospel. And seeing that the churches were being led to a false gospel, it gives us reason why we are sure that we know the true gospel so that people in our church are not being led astray. There's certainly a great number of false gospels being preached today. So let's take a look at the text here. Again, it's in the greeting portion of the letter. And it starts off by saying, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul is, is not merely saying a hi, how are you statement here. He's not merely saying, I hope you have a good day. Instead, he states grace and peace to you from God our Father. He's pointing out grace from God. He was reminding that we have received grace from God. When we think of grace or someone being gracious in a human form, we often think of showing kindness or being gentle to someone else. You get the feeling of someone who's very pleasant. But Grace from God is, is very different. It's, it's not merely kindness. Strong's Concordance defines this word stating, Favor of the merciful kindness by which God, exerting his holy influence upon souls, turns them to Christ. Now, it's a bit of a mouthful, but one of the key points we want to bring up is it is a merciful kindness. It is something that is not merely undeserved, but it is the opposite of what is deserved. It is not just showing kindness, but giving someone completely opposite of what they deserve. We committed sins, and because of this act, we deserve punishment. We deserve condemnation. We deserve death, yet God showed merciful kindness or grace to us. As it states in a well-known verse in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. We must remember that we have done nothing to be saved. It was completely by God's grace that we have been saved. Turn over to your Bible 
Bibles in the book of Romans, chapter 9, starting in verse 15. Romans 9, verse 15. Follow along with me. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So that it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. This most certainly is not something that we are able to toss aside and think it only applies to us when we accept Christ. I say this because this passage teaches us something about God. It teaches us that it is only because of God we are able to do anything. Never is it reliant upon our human effort or how hard we try. Instead, everything we do is reliant upon God. How many times in our Christian walk do we say we can't be used by God because we aren't good enough? We think if only we can do a few other things in life, then God can use us. We try to base our Christian walk on our actions. Now, we certainly don't want to dismiss sin and act as if it's nothing and it does nothing to our life. But we must remember it is God who uses us. It is God who strengthens us. It is God who carries us, who saved us. It is by grace. We do not say we achieve things in the Christian life because we work so hard and we were worthy. But that God used us. God gave us strength. It was by God's grace that we were able to do anything. And on a side note, what a relief that is. That we can put our faith, our trust in Him and not ourselves as we fail so often. What a weight off of our shoulders in knowing it is not by our failing selves, but is completely reliant upon God and His grace. So the grace portion of the gospel is most certainly relevant in our daily lives as it is a reminder that God is the one who saves and God is the one who provides. Everything we have is because of God and we must always remember that. Back to the text. So God gave us grace and because of that grace we have peace. Grace to you and peace from God the Father in our Lord Jesus Christ. I think in our day and age, one of the biggest deceptions of the devil is to distort, distort the meaning of peace. We see so many different gospels being preached today that, that are all about us. The whole purpose seems to be focused around making our lives better. Are you having issues in your marriage? Well, Jesus will fix it. Are you having issues with your finances? Jesus will fix it. You want your kids to respect you. Yeah, he'll take care of that too. Come to Jesus and you'll find love, a job, a house, and make you proud of who you are. Now don't get me wrong, Jesus can most certainly do these things. He can do anything he wants. But that's not the point. The point is that if the gospel doesn't teach, you will get these things. <clears throat> Turn over to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, starting in verse 8. I'm read all the way down to verse 11. Second Corinthians verses or chapter 4, verses 8 through 11. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not driven to despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Always carrying in the body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. For we who live are always being given. 
given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus may be manifested in our mortal flesh. Now, it's not the main purpose of this verse, but this verse shows how Christians are crushed, perplexed, persecuted, struck down, constantly being delivered over to death. These verses show that the Christian life will have pain. There will be issues. It's not, most certainly not the peace that you hear preached for many of these days. It does not fall in line with come to Jesus and you'll have no problems and your life will go on perfectly. Turn over to John chapter 15, verse 18 and 19. And read a little bit more on this. John chapter 15, verses 18 and 19. I'm sorry for jumping around too much here. If the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own, but because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Again, the world will hate you if you're a Christian. Peace with the world is not something that the gospel promises. It will hate you. Now maybe we don't buy into the, the health, wealth, and prosperity gospel. You know, we're, we're good Baptists. We don't, we don't accept that. But what about when we're caught up with wondering why our world might be falling apart? We, we wonder why people treat us poorly. Why our jobs are not going so good. Maybe we lost a job. Whatever the problem may be, do we sit and say, why, God? We are Christians, God. Why is this happening? We may not admit to believing this health and wealth and prosperity gospel. But when we are asking, why are we not in a sense believing it? Yeah, we can seek God and ask Him why. And, and we should seek God for our comfort and our pain. We should rely on Him. But believing that things should not be falling apart because we are Christians? Is that not the same as this health and wealth and prosperity gospel? Do we truly grasp that that's not what the gospel teaches? The gospel does not promise that we will have all the things the world should have. So with that being said, we must ask, well, what is the peace? That we are given because of this gospel. Where, where is it at? Or, or what were we not at peace with before we received the gospel? Uh, turn over to John chapter 3 verse 36. I'm trying to answer this question. John chapter 3 Verse 36, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. The answer is that we are not at peace with God before the gospel. We were at war against God. We were facing punishment for our sins and not standing in the right place with God. The wrath of God remained on us. As Romans states, the wages for sin is death. So we were not in a peaceful state with God. When we received grace, this peace was given to us. We are no longer condemned, and instead we can be called children of God. Now we can have peace. We can rest assured that no matter what happens in our lives, the creator of the universe is on our side. Now we can withhold to all the promises that all things work together for the good. Because we are at peace with God. No matter what comes our way, no matter what is going on in our lives, whether it be sickness, financial problems, job loss, family problems, no matter what is going on, we can be at peace because God is on our side. It doesn't mean that things are going to work out the way we want to, but it does mean that they will work together for the good. This is the peace that we have received from the gospel. And this is most certainly 
something that applies to our daily lives, not something you just receive to become part of a church. It's definitely relevant. Moving along in the text, let's go back to Galatians. That's probably way away from it now, but uh, back to Galatians. We've seen that grace and peace came from God and our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins. He gave himself for our sins. Like many things in this text, we can pull a lot from the statement, sort of what I was saying earlier, I, I don't believe we'll ever know everything there is to know about the gospel, at least this side of eternity. And so we're not going to touch on everything here, but I want to focus on he gave himself. Now Jesus Christ giving himself for our sins is certainly an incredibly good thing. It most certainly speaks volumes about God and how good he is. Oftentimes, if you were to ask a Christian, why is God good, Jesus would be the example. He's good because he gave Christ for us. However, if God's plan did not involve sending Christ for our sins, he would still be good, he would still be fair, and he would still be just. And understanding that further amplifies the fact that he gave himself, as he did not have to. Let me say that again. If God's plan did not involve sending Jesus for our sins, he would still be good, fair, and just. He would still deserve praise. Let me explain what I mean here. There's an analogy I once heard about the gospel that I really love, and it just means it hits it right on the head of the nail, I think. Imagine if we're in a courtroom today, and over here you have the judge, and he's in his robe, he's got his gavel. On this side you have the defendant, and the defendant is on trial for murder. And every single one of us here today were witnesses to this murder. We all seen it happen. And as the trial moved on, each and every one of us were called up, and each and every one of us said, Yes, Your Honor, I seen him do it. I seen him do it. He's guilty. Yes, Your Honor, I seen him do it. In fact, the man himself puts himself on the stand and says, Yeah, I did it. He's not ashamed of it. He did it. And so it comes time for the judge to read his verdict. And the judge pulls out the paper and he finds the defendant not guilty. Imagine what would be going through your head if that were a true scenario of how you would feel about this judge. You would be appalled thinking that he is awful. I mean, you would probably think worse of the judge than you were of the guy that you've seen commit the crime. And this is why God is good even if he didn't send Christ. Because God will not let anyone get away with a crime. He can't just forgive them. It would be awful. He would look just like this unfair judge. And every one of us, as many of us know, have committed a sin against God. And we deserve that guilty verdict. And that is okay. That is actually good. Because we don't want a wicked God to serve. And knowing this, Knowing that God is good and fair and just, and with all that being said, he gave himself for us, means so much more. Because he didn't have to. He was still worthy of praise, but yet he walked in and he gave himself for us. And this is the, the portion that affects us today. This is the, the motivation of our lives. As I mentioned in Romans 12 earlier, that by the mercies of God, we're to offer our entire lives to Christ as a living sacrifice. And that's the mercies. That is the motivation for us to get up. If we're struggling in our faith, our motivation is to focus on God's mercies. This is why this portion of the gospel is most certainly relevant in our lives. It's an amazing truth. Um, so let's get back to the text here. So Christ gave himself for our sins. Why? So that he might deliver us from this present evil age. <coughs> Again, many points we can pull from this.
this. So I'm only going to touch a few. First of all, the evil age is not referring to the, the current age and time where evil is still allowed. It's obvious that it doesn't mean we'll be pulled out of this time. Paul, when he was writing this letter, he just warped out of another time zone. So that's not what it's referring to. But one of the things it does mean is that we will be delivered from the punishment this present evil age will face. As I just mentioned with the courtroom analogy. Because of Christ stepping into the courtroom, for us, we don't have to face this just, fair judgment that this present evil, evil age must endure. This also means that we are no longer under the rule of this present evil age. We are delivered from the bondage or the slavery to sin. Romans 6.6 6 states, We know that our old self is crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing, so that we will no longer be enslaved to sin. We go through our lives so many times making comments that we cannot overcome sin. Christians act as if they cannot stop sinning, as if they have no power over sin. Yes, it is hard at times. Temptation is a real struggle, struggle but however to say we have no power is wrong. By the power of the cross, we have been freed from the slavery to sin. This is what Paul means in Philippians when he says, I can do all things in Christ who strengthens me. God has given us the strength to overcome sin. Turn your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. I'm sorry I don't have the slides and I make you guys use your Bibles. <laughs> You'll start bringing them more. <laughs> First Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. We are without excuse, and we are able to overcome sin, now that Jesus has delivered us from this present evil age. Again, this is most certainly relevant to our lives today. The gospel does affect us every day. It's a reminder that he's given us this, over, this ability to overcome any temptation. A couple of things I want to point out here. First of all, this, this is an incredible thing. We can go throughout our days, throughout our lives, confident that God has given us strength to overcome any temptation. We can confidently walk knowing that no matter what comes our way, God has given us a way out. This is an incredible thing. Remembering the cross serves as this reminder that God has provided you with strength. Now, along with this, there's also an amount of responsibility on our behalf. Now that God has freed us from this slavery to sin and has given us the strength and means to escape temptation, we are responsible for using this strength and going the way to escape temptation. Now, this doesn't mean if you sin, you're going to be sold back into slavery, but it does mean you're without excuse. There is no reason for you as a Christian to have sinned as God has provided a way out. We can't rationalize around it. The only answer is we didn't rely on Him. And this is why we as Christians also are commanded to address other Christians about their sins. Yes, we are to do it gently. And yes, we are to remove the logs from our own eyes. However, we are to address them. The Bible does not say, well, everyone has their sins, so we shouldn't address them. Nowhere does it say, don't talk to other Christians about their sins, because nobody is perfect. We are commanded to address them. And one of the reasons is because God has given them strength to overcome. He has provided an escape for their temptation. He has freed them from this present evil age. They are without excuse. 
Real quickly, if you're not a Christian, that doesn't mean you have an excuse. The ability to overcome sin is there when you accept Christ as a payment for your sin. So you're most well, certainly without, not without excuse because you've been given the opportunity to accept Christ. If anything, you just heard me give you that opportunity. So Jesus gave himself for our sins so that he might deliver us from this present evil age. And as the verse continues, this was all done according to the will of God the Father. All of this happened according to God's will. What an amazing thing to think about. What an amazing thing to grasp that the will of God is to save us, to deliver us from this evil age. It is God's will for Jesus to give himself up for us. Truly grasping that should bring us all to our knees. We struggle at times with being content and how we are not thankful enough. But dwell, meditate on the fact that all of these things that we just mentioned were according to God's will. It shows us an amazing truth about the character of God. It shows He loves us so much that He would go to the greatest depths to save us. While we were sinners, He done this. He didn't look down and say we are good enough and, and let me save them. He's seen us as sinners who deserve death, but loves us so much that his will was to save us. Again, the relevance of the gospel found here to our daily lives is that we can trust and approach God knowing that he goes to the greatest depths to help us. That it was his will to give his son for us. Because he loved us. As Christians, we have a relationship with God. It's one of the ultimate joys of salvation that we may know God. And through the cross, through the gospel, we see a lot of who God is. What an amazing God he really is. Continuing on in the verse, we see Paul's response to everything we just approached. And he says, To whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. It's not hard to relate to what Paul is saying here. You're hearing about God's grace, Jesus giving himself up for our sins, and delivering us from this present evil age, and all of this was according to God's will. It's easy to understand why Paul would just say to chapter 1, verse 18. For the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. What is the matter? 
message of the cross to you. If you're not a Christian, the Bible commands you to repent and believe the gospel. That means you are to turn from your life, the life of seeking your own desires, and serve God. You are to believe that you deserve punishment, that God is right and just and fair in condemning you to hell. And believe that Jesus gave himself, he took the punishment for you to deliver you from this just and right punishment you deserve. And whether you like it or not, you're making a decision right now. You can decide to repent and believe the gospel, and you will then know this power of God. Or you can choose not to. And be among the perishing who look at the gospel as foolishness. If you're a Christian, can ask yourself, what is the message of the cross to you? Do you believe grace applies to you now? Do you believe the peace received and the fact that Jesus gave himself for you applies to you now? Do you think you're past the gospel? Are you so arrogantly believing in spiritual milk? You already know it? That you need something deeper? What is the message of the cross to you? Is it foolishness? Or is it the power of God? Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for the cross. Thank you so much for giving us the Bible that we were able to study and able to learn from. Lord, please convict me just as much as everyone in here that I may realize the seriousness of relying on you day by day. And I may not just pass the gospel aside. Instead, realize the power that comes from what you've done for us. I plead with you, God, that anyone here that does not know you, please save them.